The warm sun bathed the grounds of the U.S. Military Academy in a golden glow. It was an ordinary day until, out of the clear blue sky, a sleek silver spaceship appeared. The cadets training on the field froze, their drills forgotten as they stared in amazement at the shimmering craft descending from above. Within moments, the strange ship landed softly on the parade ground, its surface gleaming in the sunlight. The officers in charge rushed forward, with wide-eyed cadets trailing behind. A hush fell over the crowd as everyone waited for the alien emissary to emerge. The tension was palpable, with murmurs rippling through the group. After what felt like an eternity, a door on the side of the ship slid open, and a ramp extended gracefully to the ground. From the depths of the ship stepped Zarkin, an imposing figure cloaked in a flowing robe that shimmered like liquid silver. His long, thin limbs and brilliant, deep blue skin set him apart as clearly not of this world. His eyes glowed softly, a luminous yellow, giving him an air of wisdom and curiosity. The cadet stood in awe, captivated by the sight. General Thompson, the Academy's commanding officer, stepped forward, his posture straight and his gaze unwavering. He gave a quick salute, trying to hide the hint of nervousness in his voice as he spoke. Welcome, Emissary. I am General Thompson, and this is the United States Military Academy. We are honored to receive you. Zarkin's gaze scanned the gathered cadets and officers, his expression unreadable. Then he nodded slowly, a small, almost imperceptible smile tugging at the corners of his mouth. I am Zarkin, emissary from the Alliance of Worlds, he said, his voice deep and melodic, each word echoing with a calm authority. I have traveled far to learn about your people and your planet. It is my hope that we may find common ground and build a future together. His words brought an excited murmur from the crowd, and a wave of whispered speculation washed over the cadets. Was Earth about to join an intergalactic alliance? The excitement was palpable, and many couldn't wait to make an impression on their otherworldly visitor. General Thompson gestured towards the Academy building, a large stone structure that stood tall on the horizon. Please, allow us to show you around, he said politely. Our cadets would be more than happy to guide you. Zarkin agreed with a gracious nod, and so began a tour of the Academy. As he walked across the grounds, cadets trailed behind, some shyly observing and others bravely trying to strike up conversations with the alien emissary. Zarkin listened carefully, nodding politely and asking thoughtful questions about their training, their ambitions, and Earth itself. He marveled at the Academy's historic architecture and examined the military equipment with interest. He stood silently for a long moment before a memorial wall engraved with the names of fallen soldiers, his glowing eyes somber and reflective. So much sacrifice, he finally said, almost to himself. Your people have known great hardship. One of the cadets, Maria Martinez, stepped forward and saluted. Yes, sir, she said. Our country has fought many wars, and we train to protect our people. Zarkin turned to her and his glowing eyes seemed to pierce through her, and what drives you to serve. Maria took a deep breath. I want to make a difference. I believe in justice and keeping the peace. Zarkin held her gaze for a moment before nodding. A noble goal, he said. The tour continued, and Zarkin saw the gymnasium where cadets trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the classrooms where they studied strategy and tactics, and the dormitories where they bonded and shared stories. Everywhere he went, the cadets were eager to impress, showing off their skills and sharing their dreams. When they reached the parade ground, Zarkin observed a demonstration of the cadets' drills. Rows of cadets marched in perfect sync, their polished boots clacking on the pavement as they followed precise, calculated movements. Their instructors barked commands, and the cadets obeyed with swift precision. It was a display of discipline and unity, and Zarkin watched intently, his glowing eyes unblinking. After the demonstration ended, the cadets lined up to meet Zarkin personally. They asked him questions about life beyond Earth, about the Alliance of Worlds, and about his people's technology. 
Zarkin answered with calm patience, explaining that the Alliance was a coalition of many worlds that had learned to live together in peace and cooperation. He spoke of their advanced technology, which had allowed them to travel vast distances in space and share knowledge across galaxies. Could Earth become a part of this Alliance? Asked a cadet named Brandon. Zarkin's eyes flickered. Perhaps, he said thoughtfully, but your world has much to prove. The Alliance values peace above all else, and our technologies would not be shared lightly. The cadets nodded solemnly, understanding the gravity of his words. The day passed quickly, and as the sun dipped below the horizon, the Academy invited Zarkin to join them for dinner. The large mess hall was filled with the hum of conversation as cadets chatted eagerly over trays of food. Zarkin sat at a central table alongside General Thompson and a few cadets who had been selected to dine with him. He listened intently as they discussed their studies, their hopes for the future, and their love for their country. Maria, the cadet who had spoken to Zarkin earlier, turned to him and asked, Emissary Zarkin, what do you think of Earth so far? Zarkin paused for a moment, his glowing eyes scanning the room. I see a world filled with potential, he said finally. Your people are driven and curious, and I believe you could achieve great things. But there is still much you must learn. What do we need to learn? Asked another cadet, his brow furrowed in curiosity. Zarkin leaned forward, his voice low but clear. Unity, he said simply. Across the galaxy, we have seen how division and conflict can tear societies apart. The Alliance of Worlds was founded on the belief that only through cooperation and understanding can we find true progress. His words settled over the table like a weight, and the cadets sat silently, absorbing his message. As the night drew to a close, General Thompson rose to his feet and thanked Zarkin for his visit. Your presence here today has given us much to think about, he said. We hope this is the beginning of a fruitful relationship between Earth and the Alliance. Zarkin stood, his tall figure casting long shadows on the mess hall floor. I, too, hope that our peoples may find common ground. Until then, I will observe your progress with great interest. With that, he bowed politely and left the hall. The cadets followed him out onto the parade ground, where his silver ship waited like a beacon in the night. Zarkin ascended the ramp and paused at the top, turning back to the crowd of cadets and officers who watched him with eager eyes. Farewell, he said, his voice echoing in the still night air. May we meet again under a bright future. The door closed, and the ship slowly rose into the air, its engines humming softly as it ascended. Within moments, it was gone, leaving only the cool night breeze and the soft murmur of the cadets' voices behind. As the cadets returned to their dormitories, each one felt a renewed sense of purpose. They knew that the eyes of the galaxy were upon them, and they were determined to prove that Earth was worthy of joining the Alliance. General Thompson stood alone on the parade ground, his gaze fixed on the starry sky. He thought of Zarkin's words about unity and wondered how Earth would respond to the challenge. One step at a time, he whispered to himself, then turned back towards the Academy building ready to lead his cadets into the future. Zarkin stood atop the hill, surveying the sprawling military camp below. Rows of tents dotted the landscape, their flaps rippling gently in the morning breeze. The cadence of rhythmic footsteps echoed up from the training grounds as squads of soldiers drilled, their boots stamping the dusty earth in unison. The metallic clink of swords and the steady thrum of bowstrings filled the air as cadets honed their skills. From his vantage point, Zarkin could see everything. The makeshift stables where tired horses rested, the weapons tents with racks of spears and shields, and the commanding officers barking orders at their troops. His lips curled in disdain. These humans and their rudimentary weapons seemed like a bad joke to him. He descended the hill, his imposing figure casting long shadows over the ground. With each step, he tightened his grip on his gleaming staff, its twisted metal adorned with runes and gems that glowed faintly. The cadets closest to him halted mid-march, eyes wide and jaws slack, 
as they took in the sight of the alien sorcerer striding towards them. The soldiers parted as he approached, some bowing awkwardly or offering salutes, unsure of how to greet this strange figure. Zarkin paid them no mind. He walked right up to the main training field, where a group of cadets practiced their swordplay. What is this? He called out, his voice echoing across the field. Are you all training, or simply putting on a show for my amusement? The soldiers paused and looked to their commanding officers for guidance. Captain Rhodes, a burly man with a thick mustache and an air of authority, stepped forward and squared his shoulders. He approached Zarkin, keeping his gaze steady. We're training these recruits, sir, Captain Rhodes replied firmly, preparing them to defend the kingdom. Zarkin's eyes flickered with amusement. Defend the kingdom. With those. He gestured toward the wooden swords the cadets wielded. Those are toys, not weapons. A few of the soldiers bristled at the comment, but Rhodes remained calm. We train with wooden swords to build skill and discipline before handing out steel. Skill and discipline. Zarkin laughed, his voice carrying across the field. Your discipline is lacking, Captain. Observe. He swung his staff in a wide arc, and a pulse of energy rippled through the air. The cadets were thrown to the ground as if struck by an invisible hand. They scrambled to their feet, faces flushed with anger and embarrassment. One of them, a young man with fiery hair, glared at Zarkin. What gives you the right to treat us like this? Zarkin met the young cadet's gaze with a cold, unyielding stare. The right comes from knowing that your training is inadequate. If a simple wave of my hand can send you tumbling like leaves in the wind, what will happen when you face a real enemy? The cadets exchanged uneasy glances, but Captain Rhodes spoke up. Your point is made, Zarkin, but we will not be cowed into abandoning our training. Zarkin snorted. Training? This is child's play. Your drills are rote, and your formations weak. Your weapons lack the edge to cut through anything more substantial than a straw dummy. Captain Rhodes stepped closer, his eyes narrowing. We may not have your magic or your fancy weapons, but we have determination and the will to defend our land. Determination. Zarkin sneered. Determination alone will not save you when faced with an enemy that knows no mercy. Your kingdom needs warriors who are ready to embrace the darkness and strike without hesitation. Rhodes clenched his fists but maintained his composure. What do you suggest, then? Abandon everything we believe in and surrender to despair. Zarkin leaned on his staff, his expression softening just slightly. No, Captain. You must train your soldiers to think beyond the ordinary. Let them see the unpredictability of battle, where the enemy will not wait for you to draw your sword. Let them learn to wield weapons that will make even the bravest foes tremble. Captain Rhodes hesitated. And how do we achieve this? Zarkin raised his staff, and a shimmering image of strange and terrifying creatures appeared in the air. Their razor-sharp fangs and glowing eyes sent chills down the cadet's spines. These are your true enemies. Not your fellow recruits or the mock battles you stage here. Prepare them for this. Rhodes turned to his cadets, who stood transfixed by the fearsome images. Form up, he barked, breaking the spell. Let's see what you're really made of. The cadets scrambled into their formations, the fire in their eyes rekindled. They grabbed their wooden swords and marched toward the practice dummies with renewed determination. They struck with more force and precision than before, their movements sharper and their shouts louder. Zarkin watched with a hint of satisfaction, but he knew that it was just the beginning. Now, he said to Captain Rhodes, where are your blacksmiths? These cadets will need more than wood if they're to stand a chance. Rhodes gestured toward a cluster of tents on the outskirts of the camp. Follow me, he said, his tone cautious but curious. The two strode through the camp, past lines of soldiers who couldn't help but steal glances at the enigmatic figure beside their captain. The air grew thick with smoke and the clanging of metal as they neared the blacksmith tents. Inside, the forges blazed hot and bright. Blacksmiths toiled over anvils, their hammers ringing with rhythmic precision. They shaped steel into swords, spears, and shields, 
their faces streaked with sweat and soot. Sarkin approached a burly blacksmith wielding a heavy hammer. Is this the best your forges can produce? He asked. The blacksmith looked up, brow furrowed. It's good steel, strong and reliable, he said gruffly. What more do you need? Zarkin held out his staff, and the gems embedded in it pulsed with light. Infuse your weapons with magic, he said. It will give your soldiers the strength to overcome even the fiercest enemies. The blacksmith scratched his chin. Magic, ha. Huh? Never worked with that before. You will now, Zarkin said. I will guide you. He swept his staff over the forge, and the flames shifted from red to a deep blue. The air crackled with energy as the blacksmiths washed in awe. Zarkin muttered incantations, and the steel on the anvils began to glow. Now strike, he ordered. The blacksmiths raised their hammers and brought them down with a resounding clang. Sparks flew, and the steel took on a faint otherworldly shimmer. They shaped swords and spears under Zarkin's washful eye each weapon infused with a hint of magic that made the blades keener and the handle sturdier. Hours later, Zarkin stood back, surveying the finished weapons. Distribute these to your best soldiers, he said to Captain Rhodes, and make sure they understand what it means to wield them. Rhodes nodded and called for his lieutenants. The newly forged weapons were handed out to the most skilled cadets, who hefted them with a mixture of excitement and reverence. Zarkin addressed the gathered soldiers. These weapons will not win the war for you, he said, his voice low and commanding. But they will give you an edge against your enemies. Use them wisely. He turned to leave, his cloak billowing behind him. As he made his way up the hill, he glanced back at the training grounds. The cadets were no longer training with the casual ease they had shown earlier. They moved with purpose each swing of their swords driven by newfound resolve. Zarkin allowed himself a thin smile. Perhaps these humans would be worth more than he had initially thought. But there was still much work to be done, and he knew that the true test was yet to come. Back in the tent, Captain Rhodes sat alone, his fingers drumming on the table as he pondered Zarkin's words. The sorcerer's arrogance had been galling, but there was no denying the power he wielded. He glanced at the shimmering sword beside him, its blade casting ghostly reflections on the campus walls. Zarkin may mock us, he muttered, but I'll be damned if we don't prove him wrong. Outside, the night deepened, and the soldiers settled into uneasy dreams, their hands gripping their enchanted swords even in sleep. The atmosphere at the military academy was tense. Zarkin's comments had cut through the air like a dagger, stirring unease among the ranks. But the soldiers had been trained to stand strong in the face of adversity, and the words of a tyrant would not sway them. Determined to demonstrate their unwavering resolve, the Academy prepared a grand exhibition of their latest technological advancements. Asterisk, asterisk, morning of the demonstration, asterisk, asterisk. The sun crested the horizon, casting a warm glow across the Academy's training grounds. The soldiers gathered in neat rows, their uniforms crisp and clean. Generals and commanders stood at attention, their faces etched with determination. The air was thick with anticipation. In the command center, General Harris surveyed the training grounds from the observation deck. His eyes scanned the rows of soldiers, taking in their stoic expressions. Today, he began, we will show the universe that humanity will not bow to tyranny. We are prepared to face any challenge, and this demonstration will prove it. The soldiers listened intently, their eyes locked on General Harris. He nodded to his second-in-command, who gave a sharp salute before leading the soldiers to their positions. The demonstration started with a low hum that grew steadily louder. The crowd watched as a sleek, unmanned aerial vehicle soared overhead. It circled the grounds before coming to a hover in front of the crowd, its reflective surface gleaming in the sunlight. A voice boomed through the speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, meet the Resoring, a fully autonomous reconnaissance drone designed for speed and stealth. The drone performed a series of maneuvers, darting through the air with effortless precision. It weaved in and out of the obstacle course set up in the distance, demonstrating its agility. 
The crowd watched in awe as the drone completed a full aerial loop before hovering above the training grounds once more. Next, we have the Vanguard-class Exosuit, the voice continued. Equipped with enhanced armor plating and servo-assisted joints, it gives our soldiers increased strength and speed. A line of soldiers wearing the exosuits marched forward. They looked like something out of a sci-fi movie, their bulky frames glistening under the sun. They moved with a fluid grace that belied the weight of their armor. One soldier stepped forward and lifted a massive metal crate with ease, holding it above his head before setting it down gently. Then came the tanks. Massive and imposing, they rolled forward with a low rumble. The lead tank stopped, and its turret swiveled toward a target in the distance. The crowd watched as a projectile shot through the air, striking the target with pinpoint accuracy. These are the Thunderstrike tanks, the voice announced, capable of withstanding heavy fire while delivering devastating blows. The tanks continued their demonstration, firing shells and showcasing their versatility across different terrains. Next up were the new plasma rifles, capable of cutting through enemy defenses with bursts of energy. Soldiers fired at targets, their rifles glowing with a bluish hue as each shot hit its mark. Finally, we present the Sentinel Defense System, the voice echoed, a network of automated turrets designed to protect strategic points. The turrets sprang to life, tracking simulated enemy drones that appeared on the horizon. They swiveled and locked onto their targets, unleashing a hail of energy bolts that reduced the drones to smoldering wreckage. Zarkin watched the demonstration from the shadows, his piercing gaze fixed on the display of human ingenuity. He stroked his chin thoughtfully as the resorring drone made another pass overhead. Despite his earlier mockery, he could not deny the skill and determination of these humans. They may be stubborn, but they are resourceful, he muttered to himself. One of his advisors stepped forward, a sinister smile playing on his lips. Do you think this display will change anything, my lord? Zarkin waved him away dismissively. They may show their weapons, but we have power beyond their understanding. They will learn this soon enough. Back at the academy, the soldiers stood tall, emboldened by their flawless demonstration. General Harris addressed them once more, his voice steady and resolute. Today, you showed the universe what we are capable of, he said. We will not be intimidated by Zarkin's words. We will face any challenge head-on and defend our people with every ounce of strength we possess. The soldiers cheered, their voices echoing across the grounds. Zarkin may have mocked them, but their resolve was unshaken. They had shown the world their strength and resolve, ready to meet the tyrant head-on and protect their home. Zarkin stood at the edge of the demonstration field, his imposing figure shrouded in an air of silent apprehension. As the human engineers paraded their latest innovations, Zarkin felt an unfamiliar pang of doubt. The weapons these humans had developed were far more advanced than he had anticipated, and their brutal efficiency left a chill settling deep within him. He had arrived on Earth as an emissary, representing his people's interest in forging alliances. They were seeking new partners in their campaign across the galaxy, and Earth's vibrant cultures and resources seemed like they could provide a useful ally. But now, as he watched the weaponry tests, he felt his enthusiasm dimming. Rows of tanks lined the demonstration field, each bristling with weaponry that gleamed in the bright sun. The soldiers snapped to attention, showcasing their discipline and determination. Zarkin saw their stoic expressions, I scanning the field with a sharp focus that hinted at their readiness. When the signal was given, they moved in flawless unison. First came the tanks. The rumble of their engines vibrated through the ground as they surged forward in formation. Turrets swiveling like watchful hawks. Explosions erupted in the distance as their shells found their targets with precision, leaving a trail of smoke and fire. Zarkin had seen the fury of battle many times, but the precision here was different. There was something unnerving about how methodical it all was. Next, the artillery batteries rumbled to life. Rockets soared into the sky with eerie whistling sounds before descending upon the marked targets with devastating force. 
Each impact left gaping craters, spewing debris into the air. Zarkin instinctively leaned back as he watched, overwhelmed by the sudden bursts of destruction. The infantry followed, advancing with mechanical precision, as they held their weapons at the ready. They navigated simulated urban environments with tactical ease, working together to clear buildings and streets with fluid movements and accurate fire. Drones circled overhead, relaying live footage to the command post where officers analyzed the battlefield from the safety of their tents. For a moment, Zarkin allowed himself to believe it was just a demonstration, just humans showing off their latest toys. But as the display continued, he realized how misguided that thought was. He noticed how the commanders stood back, overseeing their soldiers' actions with a cold focus. He sensed the trust between them and their troops, the unity that bound them all. It was more than just a show. It was a glimpse into how humans would defend their home if an alien threat like his own people came knocking. The weapons were not the only thing that struck him. The coordination and the morale of the soldiers were just as potent. Earth's military, despite their outward appearance, was far from primitive. After the demonstration concluded, Zarkin walked back to the secure briefing tent, his expression as stoic as ever. The humans had laid out a modest spread, offering refreshments to the alien guests. They had tried to create a comfortable atmosphere for negotiations, hoping to secure goodwill with these strange visitors. But Zarkin's mind was not on the tea or the biscuits. Inside the tent, a broad-shouldered general approached with an amiable smile, extending his hand in greeting. Ambassador Zarkin, I trust you found the demonstration informative. Zarkin took his hand reluctantly and offered a curt nod. It was enlightening. The general gestured to a table where maps were spread out, showing Earth's military bases and key regions. He began explaining how the demonstration was just one facet of their defense strategy, with countless more soldiers and units ready to deploy at a moment's notice. Zarkin listened, absorbing every word while carefully maintaining his composure. The humans were clearly proud of their military prowess, and they wanted to ensure the aliens understood the scale of their defense network. As the general droned on, Zarkin's gaze shifted to the tent's entrance. There, he saw a group of soldiers huddled together, sharing jokes and patting each other on the back. Their camaraderie was evident, and he sensed a deep-seated loyalty that extended beyond just rank and duty. Eventually, Zarkin excused himself and returned to the shuttle where his aide, Loria, waited. She immediately sensed his discomfort. Was the demonstration successful, my lord? Zarkin sighed deeply, shaking his head. Successful is not the word I would use, Loria. These humans possess weaponry that far exceeds our initial assessments. Loria's eyes widened, but our fleet is far more advanced than theirs. Surely their technology cannot threaten us. It's not just the technology, Zarkin replied. It's their unity. They are willing to fight for their world with everything they have. We must tread carefully. Loria nodded slowly, processing his words. What shall we do now? We will continue the negotiations, Zarkin said. But we must keep our intentions hidden for now. These humans are unpredictable. We cannot afford any rash actions that might provoke them. He paused, looking back at the bustling demonstration field where human soldiers continued to mill about. We will observe and learn, Loria. We must understand their strengths and their weaknesses. Then we will decide how best to proceed. As the shuttle took off, Zarkin couldn't shake the lingering unease from his mind. The demonstration had shown him more than just the human's military strength. It had revealed the fierce spirit that lay within them, a spirit that would make any invasion far more difficult than he had ever imagined. Back aboard the command ship orbiting Earth, Zarkin convened with the other leaders to share his findings. They had expected him to report on the humans' technological inferiority and lay out plans for a swift conquest. Instead, he presented a different reality, that humanity's spirit, coordination, and arsenal made them formidable adversaries. The other leaders debated fiercely, 
some insisting that the humans could be subdued through sheer numbers. But Zarkin cautioned them against underestimating Earth. We must think carefully about how we approach this, or we risk provoking a war we may not easily win. After hours of tense discussion, the Council agreed to continue the diplomatic approach for now. They would study humanity's strengths and weaknesses more closely and assess their best course of action. Over the following weeks, Zarkin and his team continued their observations, attending more military demonstrations, reviewing footage of exercises, and analyzing the humans' political and economic systems. They found surprising resilience in Earth's decentralized governance and noted how quickly the military could mobilize in times of crisis. But even amid the constant vigilance, the alien emissary could not fully conceal his anxiety. The humans were a threat, and every new revelation only solidified that belief. Whether they would become allies or adversaries remained to be seen. One evening, as he reviewed the latest intelligence reports in his private quarters, Loria approached him with a concerned expression. My lord, there are rumors spreading among the crew that some are questioning the mission. Zarkin frowned. Explain. Many believe that negotiations are pointless and that an invasion is inevitable. They worry we will lose the element of surprise if we wait too long. Zarkin rubbed his temples, weariness etched across his features. We cannot afford reckless decisions, remind the crew of their duty, and the consequences of disobedience. Loria nodded, but her hesitation did not go unnoticed. Of course, my lord. Zarkin knew the crew was uneasy, but he also understood the risks of moving too quickly. Earth's defenders would not falter easily, and any misstep could plunge both sides into a costly war. As he stood before the vast window overlooking the planet below, he watched the swirl of clouds and the shimmering oceans that marked Earth's vibrant surface. He had arrived here hoping to find a strategic ally but the path was now shrouded in uncertainty. He turned away from the window, determined to prepare for whatever decision lay ahead, whether Earth's weapons became a tool for their mutual gain or an obstacle to be overcome. He would ensure his people were ready for the trials to come. Hashtag, 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 chapter five. Zarkin's change of heart. Zarkin paced the metallic floors of his spaceship's command deck, the dull hum of the ship's systems and the occasional beep of a status light were the only sounds accompanying him. He glanced over to the main console, where the holographic screen glowed with the latest data gathered from the technology demonstration on Earth. The results were staggering. How could they have developed so quickly? He muttered to himself, tapping his chin thoughtfully. He replayed the footage once more. Earthlings in lab coats gathered around complex machinery pointing at glowing panels and exchanging data on small handheld devices. They had unveiled cutting-edge satellites, intricate robotics, and powerful energy systems that had surprised even his most well-informed analysts. Zarkin's bravado, previously unshaken by any challenge, began to falter. He prided himself on leading his people with confidence, but the realization of Earth's advancements left him uneasy. He turned to his lieutenant, Nalara, who stood at attention by the main console. Nalara, what do you make of this? Zarkin asked, gesturing at the glowing screen. She leaned forward to analyze the data, her eyes narrowing as she took in the details. The humans have certainly progressed since our last observation, she said, her voice steady. Their technological advancements are impressive, and they've shown ingenuity in adapting to their planet's challenges. Zarkin nodded thoughtfully. Do you think their weapons could pose a threat? Nalera hesitated for a moment before replying, It's possible. They have strong defense systems and are clearly capable of innovation. If they continue on this trajectory, they could become a formidable opponent. Zarkin turned to look out the observation window. The Earth hung in the vastness of space, a blue and white orb surrounded by twinkling stars. He had once dismissed it as a primitive backwater, but now it seemed much more significant. What if we tried a different approach? He asked, almost to himself. Nalera blinked, her antennae twitching in surprise. A different approach, sir. Yes, instead of conquest, 
perhaps we could consider diplomacy. If we could earn their trust and establish a mutually beneficial relationship, it might be more advantageous in the long term. Nellera considered his words. It could work, sir, but it would be risky. There's no guarantee they would trust us. I understand, Zarkin said, turning back to face her. But think of the potential benefits. Access to their technologies and resources, an alliance that could strengthen us both. Nalera nodded slowly. It would require careful planning. We need to devise a strategy that ensures our approach is met with understanding and cooperation, Zarkin said. Start by gathering more information on their cultures, languages, and governmental structures. We need to understand their values and how best to communicate. I will begin immediately, Nalera said with a salute before leaving the command deck. Zarkin turned back to the observation window, deep in thought. He had always believed that the only way forward was through dominance, but now he questioned that conviction. Could diplomacy truly be the answer? For the next few days, Zarkin immersed himself in studying the Earthlings' histories and societal structures. He learned about their diverse cultures, their love of innovation, and their resilient spirit in the face of adversity. The more he learned, the more he understood that Earthlings were not so different from his own people. They, too, sought security, prosperity, and progress. Nalera provided daily updates on her findings, and together they crafted a plan for a peaceful approach. They would offer Earthlings assistance with technology and knowledge in exchange for collaboration and mutual respect. When the day finally arrived to reach out to the leaders of Earth, Zarkin felt a knot of nervous anticipation in his stomach. He knew that one misstep could ruin everything. Transmit the message, Zarkin ordered. The communications officer pressed a series of glowing buttons, and the message was sent across the vast distance to the planet below. Zarkin held his breath as he waited for a response. It took several hours, but finally, a reply came through. The leaders of Earth were intrigued and cautiously interested in hearing what Zarkin had to say. A video conference was arranged, and Zarkin stood before the screen, facing a panel of Earth's leaders. They appeared skeptical, but willing to listen. Greetings, Zarkin began. I am Zarkin, leader of the Cychronian people. I come in peace and wish to propose a partnership between our two civilizations. He outlined his plan, describing how Cychronia could offer advanced technologies in medicine, agriculture, and energy production in exchange for Earth's cooperation in exploring the galaxy and developing shared scientific projects. The leaders listened carefully, their expressions ranging from wary to cautiously optimistic. After a long deliberation, they agreed to a trial partnership. In the months that followed, Zarkin and his team worked closely with Earth's scientists and diplomats. They built trust through collaboration, sharing ideas, and solving problems together. The exchange of knowledge and technology led to rapid advancements on both sides. Cychronian medical devices improved the healthcare systems on Earth, while Earth's engineers helped design efficient energy systems for Cychronia's colonies. Joint research missions expanded their understanding of the universe, and they marveled at what they could achieve together. Zarkin watched as his people formed bonds with the Earthlings, and he felt a sense of pride and relief. He had made the right choice. The fear and tension that had initially clouded their relationship gave way to friendship and mutual respect. One evening, as Zarkin stood on the observation deck of his spaceship, he gazed down at the glowing lights of Earth and thought about the path they had taken. The lessons he had learned went beyond technological advancements. They were about understanding, humility, and the value of collaboration. Nalera joined him, her eyes fixed on the same glowing orb. It's remarkable how far we've come, sir, she said softly. Yes, it is, Zarkin agreed. And I believe we've only scratched the surface of what we can accomplish together. He knew there would be challenges ahead, but he was ready to face them with their newfound allies by his side. As he looked out into the stars, he felt a renewed sense of purpose. The journey had not been what he expected, but he was grateful for the path it had taken. It was a new beginning for both their worlds, one built on trust, 
understanding, and the unwavering belief that they could create a brighter future together. And so, Zarkon resolved to guide his people with wisdom and compassion, knowing that the real strength of a leader lay not in domination, but in unity. Chapter 6 A New Path Forward In the dimly lit command chamber of the starship, Zarkon stood tall, his pale blue scales glimmering under the soft overhead lights. He tapped the holographic console before him and waited for the council to appear. A faint hum filled the air as six ethereal projections materialized around him. Each figure wore flowing robes and looked down at Zarkon, with stern expressions. They were the pinnacle of power among the Garens, the leaders of their homeworld, and they were not accustomed to having their orders questioned. Counselors, Zarkon began with a deep, respectful bow. Thank you for granting me this audience. Counselor Lyria, a woman with silver hair that cascaded down her shoulders, crossed her arms. Captain Zarkon, what is the meaning of this? You know the Garen High Council does not easily reconsider its decisions. Indeed, Counselor Garak added, his voice a low rumble like distant thunder. We have given explicit orders to proceed with our plan to subdue the earthlings. Zarkon took a deep breath, carefully choosing his words. Honored counselors, I request that we reconsider our current approach. Our intelligence shows that humans, despite their technological limitations, possess an unyielding spirit and adaptability that we cannot underestimate. A more diplomatic strategy would yield better results in the long term. The Council exchanged glances, some surprised, others skeptical. Counselor Lyria was the first to respond, her tone sharp. You speak of respect and caution, but the humans are unruly and chaotic. They cannot be trusted to negotiate fairly. What evidence do you have that suggests otherwise? Yes, Counselor Garak interjected. Our intelligence reports clearly outline their history of aggression. The path to control lies in overpowering them swiftly. Zarkon remained calm, recalling the conversations he'd had with some of the Earth leaders. Counselors, I have been communicating with key figures among the humans, and I believe that we can earn their trust. They understand the value of peaceful collaboration and are willing to negotiate terms that could be mutually beneficial. There was a long silence as the Council processed his words. Finally, Counselor Talus, a thin, elderly figure with a crown of pale horns, spoke up, his voice measured. And what makes you believe they will honor their promises? How do we know they won't simply use the negotiations as a ploy to gain time to strengthen their defenses? They may be unpredictable, Zarkin conceded, but their resilience and willingness to fight for their home should not be underestimated. Forcing them into submission could lead to prolonged conflict that would drain our resources and fuel their resolve. But if we engage them with respect, if we show that we are willing to listen, they could become allies rather than adversaries. Counselor Garak's eyes narrowed, the deep furrows in his forehead deepening. And what would this new approach look like, Captain Zarkon? Zarkon clasped his hands behind his back, standing a little straighter. We propose an envoy, a delegation of Garens who will meet with human leaders in a neutral location. This delegation will express our desire for peaceful cooperation and discuss terms that would benefit both our people. We could share some of our technological advancements in exchange for Earth resources that are abundant and valuable. The Council murmured among themselves. Councillor Lyria raised an eyebrow. And what if they refuse to negotiate or their demands are unreasonable? If they refuse, Zarkin said, then we will have a clearer understanding of their intentions and can adjust our plans accordingly. But if we approach them with respect and sincerity, I believe they will respond positively. Counselor Talus leaned forward, his glowing eyes piercing through the projection. Captain Zarkin, we place much trust in your judgment. You will lead this delegation and be responsible for ensuring the safety of our people and the success of this diplomatic mission. Zarkin nodded. I will not fail, Counselor. The other counselors shared hesitant glances before Counselor Lyria finally relented. Very well. We will grant you this opportunity. But know that our patience is limited, and if the humans prove hostile, we will proceed with the original plan. 
The holograms flickered and disappeared, leaving Zarkin alone in the command chamber. He exhaled slowly, feeling the weight of the responsibility that now rested on his shoulders. He knew that he would have to carefully choose the members of the delegation and prepare them for the challenges ahead. Within hours, Zarkin had assembled a team of Garen diplomats and scientists, each chosen for their expertise and ability to adapt quickly. They boarded a small diplomatic vessel and set a course for the agreed meeting location, a remote island in the Pacific Ocean, where both sides could speak without fear of surveillance. As the ship descended through the atmosphere, Zarkin stood on the bridge, watching the deep blue ocean spread out below them. A flat, green dot grew larger until the island came into view. The vessel gently touched down on the sandy shore, and Zarkin led his team outside, where they were met by a group of human diplomats and scientists. The humans appeared cautious, their eyes scanning the Karens warily. Zarkin approached a man in a crisp suit, his gray hair neatly combed back. Greetings, Zarkin said with a polite bow. I am Captain Zarkin, here to represent the Garen High Council. May we begin? The man offered a tight smile, extending his hand. I'm Ambassador Richards, representing the United Nations. Let's get to it. The two groups entered a tent that had been set up as a temporary negotiation chamber, the fabric walls flapping gently in the breeze. Inside, they arranged themselves around a long table. Ambassador Richards leaned forward, lacing his fingers together. Captain Zarkin, you've come to discuss peace, but your fleet looms above us. How can we trust your intentions? Zarkin met his gaze calmly. Our fleet is a precaution, should negotiations break down. But we have no desire to impose our will upon your world if cooperation is possible. Our people wish to share our technology in exchange for resources that could sustain our continued exploration. And what guarantees do we have that this won't lead to exploitation or interference in our affairs? Ambassador Richards asked. Only the word of our council, Zarkin replied earnestly. We are not here to rule over you. Our interest is in mutual prosperity. We will respect your sovereignty and limit our presence to the terms of any agreement we reach. The two sides began to discuss specifics. The humans sought assurances that Garen technology would not be used to interfere with their governments or economies, while the Garens wanted to ensure a steady supply of rare earth minerals for their continued expansion. Both sides presented their concerns candidly, and despite moments of tension, they gradually found common ground. After hours of negotiation, Zarkin stood and offered his hand to Ambassador Richards. It seems we have reached a preliminary agreement. I hope that this is the beginning of a long and prosperous relationship between our peoples. Ambassador Richards shook his hand firmly. Let's hope this is a new chapter for both our civilizations. Back aboard the starship, Zarkin delivered the news to the Garen High Council. They listened intently as he outlined the terms of the agreement, the concessions made, and the benefits to their people. Councillor Garrick stroked his chin thoughtfully. You have done well, Captain Zarkin. We will proceed with this new strategy and build upon the relationship you have established. Continue to monitor the humans and keep us informed of any changes. Zarkin bowed deeply. As you wish, Counselor. As he left the command chamber, Zarkin felt a sense of relief. The humans had proven to be reasonable negotiators, and the agreement they had reached was a promising step toward lasting peace. But he knew there was still much work to be done, and not everyone in the Garen fleet would support the new approach. In the coming weeks, Zarkin and his team worked tirelessly to ensure the agreement was upheld. They coordinated with the United Nations to establish research centers where Garen scientists could collaborate with their human counterparts. Together, they developed new technologies that improved energy production, medical treatments, and communication systems. Despite their efforts, some humans remained skeptical, fearing that the Garens would eventually betray them. In response, Zarkin launched an outreach campaign, inviting influential journalists and public figures to tour the starship and meet with Garen leaders. He hoped that by fostering understanding, he could dispel the fears and mistrust that lingered. Meanwhile, 
Factions within the Garen fleet voiced their dissent, arguing that the Council was risking their future by trusting the unpredictable humans. Sarkin understood their concerns, but he remained steadfast in his belief that cooperation would ultimately prevail. As the months passed, the relationship between the two species deepened. Trade routes were established, joint scientific endeavors flourished, and cultural exchanges brought new insights and appreciation on both sides. Zarkin remained vigilant, always watching for signs of trouble, but he found that the majority of humans were eager to build a better future together. One evening, as he gazed out at Earth from the observation deck of the starship, Zarkin allowed himself a rare moment of optimism. He knew there would be challenges ahead, but he was convinced that they had taken a crucial step in the right direction. In that quiet moment, he felt hopeful. The unpredictability of human resilience had proven to be a source of strength, not an obstacle. And now, together with the Garens, it would shape a new path forward for both their worlds. After Zarkin returned to the academy for the second meeting, he stood in front of the gathered cadets. His imposing figure seemed a little softer this time, as if he'd shed some of the armor of arrogance he'd worn previously. With a deep breath, he began to speak. Cadets, Zarkin started, his voice resonating through the hall. I underestimated you. I failed to recognize the human spirit and its resilience. You've proven yourselves in ways I never imagined. He paced back and forth on the stage, eyes scanning the crowd. Some cadets were still wary of him, remembering his previous condescending attitude. Others were curious about his change of heart. I apologize, he said firmly, pausing to look each cadet in the eye. I've learned a valuable lesson from your spirit, your creativity, and your courage. You've shown me that Earth's defense system is not to be taken lightly. The cadets sat a little taller at the recognition. Zarkin's compliment felt genuine. For a moment, silence hung in the air before he continued. It takes great strength to admit when we're wrong. I have much to learn from all of you. One cadet, a tall young man named Jake, raised his hand and stood up. Sir, what happens now? Zarkin nodded thoughtfully. A fair question. Now we must prepare together. I believe that my knowledge, combined with your ingenuity, can create a formidable alliance. Our goal is simple. Protect this planet from threats far beyond what we've seen so far. A buzz of whispers filled the hall as cadets discussed the implications of this new alliance. Zarkin continued, Each of you has a role to play in this defense system. You've been trained to think quickly, act decisively, and to never give up. Those skills will be critical as we face what's to come. Another cadet raised her hand. And what exactly is to come, sir? More than you know, Zarkin answered. But I promise you this, with our combined strength, we can withstand anything. He took a step back from the podium, motioning for Commander Lewis, the Academy's leader, to join him. Commander Lewis and I have discussed our strategy. He will now provide an overview of what's to come. Zarkin stepped forward again, raising a hand to quiet the room. And remember, no matter the challenge, you have the power within you to overcome it. Trust in yourselves and each other. Together, we are unbeatable. With that, he saluted the cadets, who returned the gesture with newfound confidence. They knew that their training had only just begun, but they were ready to face the future, side by side with their new allies. And so, as they filed out of the hall, their heads held high, the cadets felt the weight of responsibility settle on their shoulders. They were now part of something bigger than themselves, a force that would protect Earth and uphold the alliance Zarkin had envisioned. In the days that followed, the Academy continued to hum with activity. Zarkin and Commander Lewis worked tirelessly to fine-tune the new defense system, ensuring that every city and strategic point was fortified. The cadets, now fully trained, were ready for deployment. But even as the tension simmered with the promise of potential threats, the Alliance stood firm. The cadets and Zarkin's engineers worked hand in hand, united by a shared purpose. As Zarkin walked through the Academy one final time, he felt a sense of calm wash over him. He had learned to appreciate the spirit of Earth's defenders 
and found solace in their unwavering determination. He knew that they would be ready for whatever lay ahead. With a final nod to Commander Lewis, Zarkin departed, leaving behind a legacy of cooperation and newfound respect. The cadets watched him go, knowing that they would uphold his trust. For now, their journey had only just begun. In the previous chapters of this story, tension simmered between the alien species known as the Zarkin and humanity, a distrust rooted in their past conflicts and vastly different ways of life. But after realizing the gravity of the looming cosmic threat, they recognized that they could only prevail if they stood together. Now we witness the culmination of their journey, the formation of a strategic alliance that could change the fate of both species. Hashtag, 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 chapter 8. An unexpected advocate. The crisp morning sun bathed the verdant valley where the human and Zarkin leaders gathered. The air was thick with anticipation and every murmur from the assembled soldiers felt like a pebble dropped into a still pond, rippling outwards in waves of anxiety. Captain Maradonovan stood with her fellow officers on one side of the clearing, trying to keep her posture relaxed as she surveyed the alien delegation across the way. The Zarkin generals loomed imposingly with their emerald green scales glistening in the early light. In the center stood General Thranek, their eldest and wisest leader, and beside him, a smaller figure that Captain Donovan recognized as none other than Zarkin himself. Zarkin had earned a reputation as a fierce defender of his people, yet his presence here was not to demand or berate, but to foster unity. His voice, a low, echoing rumble, reverberated through the air as he addressed the crowd. Brothers and sisters of both species, he began, casting his gaze across the assembly. The time has come to set aside old grievances. We share a common enemy who threatens all life in this quadrant. Alone, we will perish. Together, we can defend our homes and ensure a future. His words stirred a murmur among the humans, many of whom had not expected such a forthright admission from a Zarkin leader. Captain Donovan herself felt a flicker of hope, and she exchanged a glance with her second-in-command, Lieutenant Reschelin. Aang nodded subtly acknowledging the weight of the moment. As Zarkin finished speaking, Captain Donovan stepped forward. Her crisp, clear voice carried through the clearing. We, too, understand the stakes. Our world is threatened, and we need allies who can stand with us against this menace. Let us forge a new path together, one of trust and collaboration. General Thranek crossed the clearing and offered his clawed hand to Captain Donovan, who grasped it firmly the two species bridging a gap that had seemed impossible only weeks ago. The alliance was sealed, and preparations began immediately. In the days that followed, human and Zarkin engineers worked tirelessly to meld their technologies, creating hybrid defense systems that combined the best of both worlds. Each side learned from the other, their understanding and camaraderie growing daily. One night, Zarkin stood atop a ridge overlooking the valley deep in thought, as he watched the combined forces train below. The alien strategists saw potential here, a unity that could make them a formidable defense against the cosmic threat, but he knew their alliance was still fragile. His reptilian eyes reflected the moonlight as he turned to the approaching figure behind him. I thought I might find you here, Captain Donovan said with a smile as she joined him. The view is better here, Zarkin replied with a flicker of amusement. They stood silently for a moment, watching the troops below. You've become an unexpected advocate for our cause, Donovan said at last. I think many were surprised by your willingness to cooperate. Zarkin nodded slowly. It is the logical path. But beyond that, my people deserve a future where they can thrive and not be consumed by fear or war. As do mine, Donovan agreed. But trust will take time. It will, Zarkin said, and there will be challenges. The following weeks brought their fair share of trials. Miscommunications and cultural clashes flared up periodically, testing the patience of both sides. But each time, Zarkin and Donovan intervened to mediate, emphasizing the shared goal that bound them together. At last, the day came when they would face their greatest test. The cosmic threat they had anticipated, 
a marauding force of metallic drones commanded by a sentient eye, descended upon their combined fleet. The battle was fierce. Metallic drones swarmed the sky, darting between the human and Zarkon fighters like silver arrows. The hybrid defense systems held their ground, blasting enemy ships with precise bursts of energy, but the enemy's relentless waves threatened to overwhelm them. In the heat of battle, Captain Donovan piloted her craft alongside Zarkon's flagship, coordinating maneuvers through a shared communications link. Their right flank is vulnerable, she shouted. If we can break through, we can hit their command ship. I see it, Zarkon replied. I'll lead the charge. With a mighty roar, his flagship launched forward, its sleek hull slicing through the enemy line like a spear. Donovan followed closely, her human pilots flanking her sides as they dove into the heart of the drone swarm. The battle grew even more intense, but their combined might was enough to break through the defenses and deliver a devastating blow to the command ship. With the destruction of their leader, the drones lost their coordination and quickly fell into disarray. The human Zarkon fleet pursued them across the battlefield, eliminating stragglers until the sky was clear once more. The cost had been high. Many had given their lives, and both fleets had suffered losses. But their victory had proven the strength of their alliance. In the aftermath, Captain Donovan and Zarkon stood amidst the rubble, looking out over the smoking remnants of the enemy fleet. We did it, Donovan said quietly. Together. Zarkon's reptilian face softened into a grim smile. Together, he agreed. This was only a beginning. There will be more threats in the future. And we will face them, Donovan said resolutely. With our forces united, General Thranic approached them, his scales scorched from battle. I have never seen such unity between our species, he said. Perhaps this alliance can endure. It must endure, Zarkon said firmly. Our people have seen what we can achieve. They will come to accept it. Donovan nodded. We'll ensure that they do. In the days that followed, the scars of battle healed slowly, and the groundwork was laid for the continued cooperation between human and Zarkon forces. Joint research teams developed new technologies to bolster their defenses, and cross-training programs helped soldiers of both species understand each other's tactics. Over time, Suspicion and distrust gave way to respect and even camaraderie. Friendships formed as humans and Zarkon fought side by side to maintain peace. Children from both species grew up learning of their shared history and the dangers of old prejudices. Zarkon, once viewed with suspicion by both sides, became a symbol of the Alliance's success. His voice held sway among the Zarkon people, urging them to embrace cooperation and a shared future. Captain Donovan continued to serve as a bridge between the two cultures, helping forge bonds that would weather the storms ahead. Years later, as they stood before a new generation of recruits preparing to defend their homeworlds, Zarkin and Donovan reflected on how far they had come. Our world has changed, Zarkin said to the gathered crowd. Our alliance has grown stronger, and so has our resolve. Together, we will face whatever lies beyond the stars. And we will endure, Donovan added, her eyes shining. For we are stronger united. The recruits stood shoulder to shoulder, their human uniforms blending seamlessly with the iridescent armor of the Zarkon warriors. As they saluted their leaders, a new era dawned, promising a future of unity, strength, and hope. The strategic alliance between the Zarkon and human forces, once unimaginable, had become their greatest weapon against a universe of uncertainty. And in that moment, as their cheers rose to the heavens, Captain Donovan and Zarkin knew that no matter what cosmic threats lay ahead, their people would stand together, always ready to face the challenge.